It's a great pleasure to be here in New York. Uh, I love New York. It's the Yankees I hate, but the Yankees are losing, so big deal, right? But the Mets are doing well, right? <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about the AML uh, landscape of 2018. You've all heard, uh, you've all seen many of the slides I was going to show. So I encourage you either to fall asleep, surf the internet, or, but I'm going to try to make it a little bit more interactive here. So first of all, how many people here, how many people here are actually doctors and not drug company people? <laughs> Doctors, doctors, raise your hand. Excellent. Or nurses. Okay, great. How many people actually treat AML regularly? Not a bad amount. Okay, good. So let's find out. I'm going to try to make this interactive. Uh, I'm going to skip over some of the slides you saw already. Some of them you saw three times. I was going to make it four. Um, how do I do this? Is this a? This is like you got to see this. This mouse is taped. That's a. That's a, oh, I see. That's a mouse that does. Oh, I can point. Excellent. Okay, so these are my uh, disclosures. Um, this is where we work. David and I work in a beautiful city. It's not New York. When I came in from Kennedy Airport this morning, I, you go south on that expressway, a great view of the Manhattan skyline, beautiful place. Um, anyway, uh, so you heard about all these new drugs. I'm gonna try to focus, I just threw a few more slides in my thing to, to highlight a couple of areas I think that might be interesting, particularly MRD and a little bit more about venetoclax. Um, I think you know the risk factors for AML. Age, 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 also a little bit, ionizing radiation, uh, chemotherapy for other cancers, the man and woman made leukemia, radiation for industrial, uh, therapeutic, or military, God forbid, purposes. Although, you, well, with Trump's finger on the nuclear button, I would worry about the ionizing radiation-induced leukemias. Anyway, um, so, He's a very big button, I'm told. Uh, <laughs> small hands, though. Small hands. Small hands. So uh, he said that. He said it's a big button. So uh, I didn't say that. So it's a very important to recognize, in all seriousness, what, what, uh, how AML is made up. Because this is how therapy is being developed. By knowing the pathophysiological background, we might be able to design therapies. So far, we've been pretty good about designing uh, Inhibitory, inhibiting gain of function genes like FLT3. Maybe we'll learn how to inhibit RAS uh, and KIT. Uh, but chromatin modifying genes, we haven't been so good. Dr. Steens was leading a trial with spliceosome inhibitors based on work done by Dr. Uh, Omar, uh, Omar Abdul Wahab down the street here at Memorial Sloan Kettering, who's shown that spliceosome mutations in the haploinsufficient state, maybe uh, if you inhibit the other one, you may have synthetic lethality. So some interesting things on the horizon. I'll talk about some of the things that look closer. Now, you, everybody says that AML is a heterogeneous disease. It is a heterogeneous disease. So there's a big debate about whether we should, and you just heard about this, whether we really should be targeting these different subtypes, if we can, whether we should be going for a more global um, strategy, taking advantage of things that are, that are uh, transmitted across all the different subtypes. Um, so you can see on the left that chromosomes are very important. If you have an inversion three, which is an abnormality of the MECOM gene, formerly called EVI1, it's terrible. If you have an inversion of chromosome 16, it's not so terrible, but it's never good to have leukemia. How many people walk in the room to a patient with inversion 16 or 821 and say, hey, good news, you've got favorable prognosis AML? Well, I do that, but it's, it's just, we all know that it's not fun to have AML, even if it's favorable prognosis. And you can also look at the, um, the separate genes here, with P53 being, uh, as we say in Boston, wicked, wicked awful. Um, so uh, anyway, what do we, everybody wants to know, what do we need to send at diagnosis? Obviously you need to know the age of the patient, their comorbid conditions. You want to get cytogenetics and molecular studies. Cyto don't send fish to do cytogenetics, uh, only fish if the metaphases don't grow. Uh, the, four, the, the, the top three genes to send are FLT3 ITD, so you can decide if they need mitostorin, NPM1, which is a favorable prognosis, and CBP alpha biallelic, which is hard to sequence, but if you've got a biallelic CBP alpha mutation, that's favorable. Now, on the bottom there is the ELN recommended genes you should also check for RUNX1, TP53, ASXL1, KIT maybe, and CBF. Those are all unfavorable, and uh, the ELN classification system, which I'll show you in a minute, does require those genes to know the prognosis. So how many people here send 
uh, of those of you who treat AML, how many people send an NGS panel at diagnosis? A few, but most don't. So that's interesting. So you're, most people, I bet the ones who don't are all sending the other three, right? So um, I think it's helpful to do, do all of them. And you'll see maybe another reason in a minute why uh, some recent data suggests that you should send an NGS panel. So another thing that we uh, are behind Europe on, um, uh, in addition to a democracy apparently, we uh, have, uh, they, they have looked at, uh, they have changed the classification system for AML. They used to have four subtypes, now they have three subtypes. I just want to point out a couple of features that are interesting. Everybody knows that um, the so-called CBF abnormalities, 821 and version 16, are favorable. But NPM1 is favorable without a FLT3 ITD, but they've done something called FLT3 ITD low, which means if you're allylic ratio uh, of FLT3 normal to abnormal is high, in other words, very few abnormal alleles, then your prognosis is just as good as if you didn't have FLT3. Okay, now, honestly now, how many people here send, uh, know what the FLT3 allelic ratio is when they send, uh, when they have a patient with AML? Anybody? We don't. We have one guy, Yale. Well, okay, Yale beats Harvard there. Um, so, uh, also, as I mentioned before, the ELN looked at the run X1, ASXL1, which you're not going to get unless you send uh, an NGS panel, and P53 is very bad. Uh, the rest of it you can get by chromosome. So what I would say, and I'm interested in uh, what you guys think about this, is I would advocate for waiting, if at all possible, to get the NGS data, if possible, and the uh, chromosome data, if you can. Uh, it's not always easy, but if you think about some of the things that were uh, mentioned by Gunter and Amir in the last few minutes, you'd like to know if a patient has CD33, obviously that's flow, You'd like to know if a patient has a FLT3 uh, and perhaps others. So um, I, I like to find out. P53, uh, as you'll see in a minute, some of us treat that differently. We don't use 3 and 7 for P53 because the, the uh, outcome is terrible. So a little bit about uh, complete remission. Now, all of us were taught to strive for complete remission with AML. We divide therapy into two big categories. It's not like lymphoma, we give the same therapy over and over and believe we successively knock off the cancer. Here we give induction therapy. The general reason for that is that we have done it for four decades. Uh, if you ask somebody if there's a rationale, you might hear something like, well, if you have a lot of leukemic cells at diagnosis, you're sick, so you need a special thing called induction therapy. And uh, that takes the tumor burden down from 10 to the 12th to 10 to the 9th but you still have a ton of leukemic cells that you can't detect by lead light microscope. So it stands to reason that if we have better detection than just looking uh, at the microscope for one in 20 cells that are abnormal, and that, you know, that's 5%, that's the golden number you want to get below to be in remission with normal blood counts, then uh, some, not all remissions are the same. So that's, that's, a, that's important, and that may be changing the way we practice in the future and the way we develop drugs. By the way, the ELN also recommends MRD monitoring for this very purpose, for this very reason. You can monitor the remission status by looking at the light microscope. That's one in 20. You can do cytogenics at the time of remission, clinical remission, with the counts of normal. The bone marrow is less than 5% blast, but you, that's not much more sensitive. Um, if you look at fish, uh, it's a little bit more sensitive than metaphase cytogenics. But really, we're talking about multi-parameter flow or PCR-based uh, sequencing, if you know what gene is abnormal, that's one in 10, th one in 10 to the fourth sensitive approximately. So uh, perhaps it's not surprising that a remission at a lower level of disease burden is better than a remission at a higher level of disease burden, right? So this is shown over and over again. This is data from the Brits where they looked at patients who you had to have an NPM1 mutation at diagnosis to be on this curve because that's how they measured the MRD in this case. That's about 30 or 40 percent of AML patients that are younger than 60. And so if you have, after two cycles, and it's also important to know when you're measuring the MRD. So this is after two cycles of induction chemo in Europe, they generally give people two cycles of induction chemo. You ask, simply ask whether the, you can PCR the, MR, the NPM1 mutation that was present at diagnosis. If you can PCR that, you're going to relapse. Uh, quite a bit. This is the relapse over here. 
your relapse, your 86% relapse rate. That's like not even being remission. Just if you can, so that's important. If you, if, uh, if you can't find it, uh, you still relapse about 30% of the time, but a lot less than uh, if you can still detect the uh, mutant allele. Um, now, of course, you'd say, well, okay, my MRD patient, uh, MRD positive patient needs, needs new therapy. Let's do a transplant. Well, allogeneic transplants done in conventional ways, and we'll see what Gutcher says about this, really don't work that well if you've got MRD positive disease. And this is a study from uh, University of Washington in Seattle where they looked at the 24 patients who were MRD positive and they had a two-thirds relapse rate. And the ones who were, um, and they didn't, they, their survival rate was only one, one quarter. And it was completely different if you were MRD negative. So routine allogeneic transplant doesn't seem to ablate the negative prognostic uh, value of having uh, MRD positivity. Now, this is a recent paper. I just threw this slide in. Uh, uh, this was just published in New England Journal of Medicine. I think it's important because this is a third way to detect MRD using next generation sequence, which I refer to a diagnosis uh, to help with the, prognosis, with the prognosis. But now if you do NGS sequencing and there's different techniques, which I won't bore you with, but some are more sensitive than others. Uh, and in this hovon sac uh, study from, which is in Belgium and Switzerland, and Holland, um, they took age 18 to 65 AML patients. They had 482, 430 had at least one mutation at the time of diagnosis. And uh, I'm gonna ask Dr. Steensman to comment here uh, about this, because he wrote an editorial and has written extensively about this issue. It turns out that three genes didn't make any difference in terms of relapse. DMT3A, TET2, and uh, ASX01, DTA which I thought meant don't touch anything, but it, it means uh, uh, it's also, those are the same three things that are common in CHIP. David, could you explain what CHIP is and clinically benign voices? Yeah. yeah. So it's, it, we've compared this uh, to like if there's a Richter transformation and you treat the aggressive component and you go back and you just have the more indolent component, it probably takes a long time to get another mutation that then leads to progression. So you're, you're really just going back to a, a precursor Yeah, you're going uh, back state. to the roots, but a lot of people, uh, some of the older folks in the audience like me might have, uh, might be walking around with a TET2 mutation in our, because you, that was uh, important work done by Ebert and others that showed right. that uh, healthy adults, uh, seemingly healthy adults, can have a TET2 or an ASX1 or a DMT3 mutation uh, in their bone marrows, and those people have a higher incidence of cardiovascular death, which opens up a whole interesting um, field of study, actually. Uh, actually, interestingly, and also another part about the study that I found interesting was that uh, if you measured MRD by flow cytometry, which is a probably more technically difficult and more subject to operator bias, that uh, you, it, it was additive information. In other words, if you were positive both by MRD and NGS, uh, by flow and NGS, you had a high relapse rate. If you were positive by neither, you had a virtually nil relapse rate. And if you were positive by one or the other, one or the other, you had an intermediate level of relapse. So I think they, and that we, if we have time, we can talk about why that might be the case having to do with which stem cells are actually, you're actually looking at. Okay, the problem with uh, MRD and AML, and that's, uh, uh, this is a challenging thing. The Europeans want us to measure it, but what the heck do you do about it? Uh, all I find really, to make a long story short, is that uh, MRD uh, increases anxiety on the part of the stem cell transplant doctors and on the patients because we really don't know how to reliably get rid of it. There is one study by uh, Seattle that suggests that if you do a double umbilical cord blood, you can erase the um, negative prognostic value of MRD positive. I was in a meeting yesterday in uh, California where Dr. Applebaum was one of the co-authors of that study and he kind of hemmed and hawed if I asked him if they really do a, uh, an umbilical cord transplant on people who have a matched unrelated donor but have MRD positivity. Um, he said sometimes they do it. So, uh, so here, <laughs> here's what I think the way we should treat people under age 60 today, synthesizing all the information you heard from the excellent talks that preceded mine. We still use Donorubicin and ARIS-C as the backbone for fit younger patients, which is virtually all younger patients, let's say. And there's a debate about what dose of Donorubicin to use, okay? 
All right, of those of you who treat AML, how many use 60 milligrams for the average uh, middle-aged adult with AML? How many use 60? Okay, how many use 90? Pretty equivalent. Well, um, the trick is 90 was better than 45 in the ECOG 1900 study. 90 was, better than, 90 was not better than 60 in the MRC study. So does that mean 60 is good? Then there were retrospective looks at both those. And in the FLT3 ITD patients, both in the 90 versus 45 and in the 90 versus 60, it was better to get the higher dose even to FLT3 ITD. So FLT3 ITD is a chemo-responsive disease. It's easy to debulk it uh, with chemotherapy and maybe with a mitostorin, but you need to really follow it up with a transplant, as uh, Gunter said. Um, but I do use mitostorin for the 14 days as per the ratified trial. Now, what about gemtuzumab? There was a lot of discussion about that. The approval is wide. It's wide as for any patient with CD33 positive AML, and you're supposed to add it on day one. So you're going to add it on day one, and then if you find out three days later the FLT3 is positive, are you going to get add mitostorin? Maybe, but it hasn't been proven to be safe to add together. There is data that gemtuzumab might be very effective in FLT3. It's just a way to deliver chemotherapy, another way to deliver chemotherapy. So I think it's a it's a uh, it's a tr it's a tricky thing. What we do at Dana Farber, because I don't know why we we use the uh, we tend to use the myelotarg only in the CBF patients. You saw the data that suggests that that's the group that benefits the most. Most, but you know that's probably not a fair thing to do. What about transplant? Who do I transplant? I transplant everybody except patients with a CBF abnormality. And you can then ask, well, what if they're MRD positive? Maybe you should transplant those. Debatable. Uh, everybody else, I try to transplant a CBF abnormality or NPM1 mutant, FLT3 wild type. Otherwise, I try to transplant them in first remission. And if they have really bad uh, prognosis, I will ask my transplanter to consider a haploidentical transplant or a cord blood transplant if they don't have a sibling match or unrelated donor. Um, well, that's a tricky thing. And of course, if they're MRD positive and they're going for a transplant, um, then we pray and, and hope we have an MRD erasure pretty soon. Uh, I'm not going to go through this stuff. You heard it all before. Um, so uh, I do think, though, that curves that were shown about both with the uh, CPX and with the ratified uh, and with the mitostorin, if you get a lower tumor burden at the time of going to transplant, you do better. And I think that's why this curve is the way it is. The people who transplanted first remission who were exposed to mitostorin uh, did better. Can I prove to you that that's because they had a lower level of MRD? No, of course not. We didn't uh, study that in the trial. There are newer FLT3 inhibitors, gilteridinib and quizartinib, which are more potent and specific. Does that mean they're going to be better? We don't know, especially up front. It may be better to use a, uh, a less targeted agent. Maybe at relapse, it's better to use a targeted agent. We'll see. There were trials of gilteritinib versus dealer's choice chemo in relapse refractory FLT3 ITD or TKD AML. There was a trial of quizartinib, which only hits the ITD, versus dealer's choice chemo in relapse refractory AML. So we'll see. Uh, but again, just if those are positive, their survival uh, benefits, so they'll be good. I mean, their survival is the endpoint, so they'll, unlike uh, ivacidinib and acidinib, we'll be able to uh, use those. So I'm just going to, uh, there is going to be a trial of uh, chemo plus quinolinib, which is a specific FLT3 inhibitor versus chemo plus mitostorin, the new standard to see if using the specific FLT3 inhibitor up front might be a better idea. Uh, Mylotarg, you heard about, uh, I just mentioned, I'm not going to go through this, you saw all these slides. Uh, VOD, by the way, at least in the with a lower fractionated dose, seems to be lower. Having said that, of course, we've all seen some shambles. Uh, the, the, the one bad experience is the one you remember, and we've seen a couple of those lately with myelotarg and then transplant or even myelotarg without transplant. Older adults do miserably. Um, why do they do miserably? Because they're older, their kidneys and livers and stuff have been around for eight, nine decades. Uh, they can't excrete the chemo. Their bone marrow stem cells are less tolerant of chemotherapy. Uh, so I still treat the fit older adults with three and seven, except for uh, patients with secondary, uh, bona fide secondary AML after MDS, with MDS-related uh, abnormalities. I do believe the data with CPX351 in some magical way. It keeps the donorubicin cytarabine hanging around in the bone marrow compartment for a longer period of time. That may be helpful for these bad people. We still don't know whether P53 patients 
or other adverse genetic patients benefit from CPX because the company did not do prospective NG, uh, NGS before they did the trial to see which patients benefited. That's being done retrospectively by Dr. Lindsley at our institution. And what about the P53 patients? Do I really give them chemotherapy? Um, not always. I consider 10-day decitabine. Uh, why? I'll come back to that one. Well, uh, uh, yeah, because of this one. Because of the Welch, uh, Dr. Welch's paper, New Individual Medicine, a couple years ago, which showed that if you give 10-day decitabine, you ablate the P53 clone, at least temporarily, and the prognosis, if you look on the right, is magically as good or as bad as it is for the uh, P53 wild type patients. Um, you heard about, yeah. I just want to mention one important thing. This is work done in our institution uh, by Lindsley and Ebert and others uh, that suggests that the genetics at the time of diagnosis, even in a patient with de novo AML, are highly predictive for outcome. So if you've got, these are patients that David, Martha, Dan and I thought had de novo AML, but if they had a P53 mutation or a secondary type uh, mutation like an A6L1 that you get an MDS, they did miserably. But if they had a FLT3 or an NRAS, a PAN-AML mutation, they didn't do so badly. So that might be a new way to look at fitness plus genetics. CPX351, you heard about. I'm not going to go over that. You saw that. Uh, Enosidinib, you heard about. I just want to mention a little bit. Enosidinib, uh, this is one slide you didn't see. Enosidinib and ivacidinib don't work equally well in all patients. Uh, Agios and Celgene did give them credit for measuring uh, the genetics at the time of enrollment on the trial to see if there were genetic subtypes that predicted for response. If you had a, uh, in this case, if you had what's called a pan-AML or a receptor tyrosine kinase mutation, you didn't respond that well to either inosidinib or ivacidinib. It doesn't mean you shouldn't give them uh, to patients with those mutations, but it's something to think about. Uh, Venetoclax is really neat. It binds uh, the, uh, it, it, it binds the uh, protein that uh, prevents holes from being made in the mitochondrial cell membrane. So in the presence of venetoclax, you can make the holes in the mitochondrial membrane uh, in response to gene toxic stress and might help cells to die. They couldn't do it otherwise. Um, and this is the response rate with HMA, AZA, or decidabine plus venetoclax. may be hard to see, but the overall response rate, which is on the bottom right, is 70%, much higher than you expect from uh, AZA alone. And there are a lot of people who think, including me, that should we really wait for the phase three trial sponsored by Abby of venetoclax, I mean of uh, AZA plus or minus venetoclax and unfit patients, these people have to be older than 75 uh, or uh, unfit for other reasons. I don't know, I, I use a lot of it off label and I'm, I'm pretty pleased with the results. Um, Dr. Wei from Australia where they use a lot of ARIS-C did a trial of, ARIS, of cytarabine, low dose cytarabine plus venetoclax with pretty high response rates. Unfortunately, the survival in those with bad risk uh, genetic features wasn't all that good. So maybe we can't ablate the negative prognostic feature. One thing that might be a good MRD eraser is an antibody like this one. This is flotituzumab. It's a CD123, CD3 bispecific dart, a dual antibody retargeting agent that w very narrowly can put the CD3 positive uh, effector T cell next to the target CD123 uh, leukemic cell and uh, might be a way to use the immune system rather than chemotherapy to kill those few residual undetectable leukemic cells. So I'm just hopeful that will be something in the future. There was a little data presented with that at ASH. Um, I'm not going to go through this. I'm way over time. So I'm just going to uh, end with what you all know. We have new toys to play with in AML. How they should be used is a matter of some debate. I thought I'd, get, I'd try to give you my thoughts and the thoughts of my colleagues at DFCI. There are a bunch of new things on the horizon, uh, most importantly, venetoclax. Thanks.